This is Leading with Power. Welcome to Leading with Power Conversations today with Dr. Stephen Mansfield, New York Times bestselling author and speaker. Before we begin, we want to extend a uh, thank you to our sponsors in Wausau, Hurtis Heating and Air Conditioning. You can find them at hurtisheating.com. Brickner's Car Dealerships, you can find them at bricknerfamily.com in Madison. Green Clock Agency, Fearings, and Wellshire Advisors, and in La Crosse, and to our many sponsors, you know who you are. Thank you so much for making this possible. And for those that remain anonymous, thank you so much for your support, too. We really are thankful. 35 years ago, I heard a talk by Major Ian Thomas entitled, Any Old Bush Will Do. He spoke about Moses' encounter with a burning bush. He said that the miracle was in the fire in the bush. God was in the old, ordinary bush, making it extraordinary. Today, men, any old bush will do. Allow the extraordinary fire of God to light you up. It's not so much about your ability, but about your availability to the fire of God. Are you ready? Today, Dr. Stephen Mansfield is going to continue our conversation with us. This is session number three entitled Men on Fire. Stephen has written a book on the subject, so get ready. Please welcome Dr. Stephen Mansfield. Stephen? Hey, it's great to be with you. Thank you, man. Guys, it's so good to be with you, and I'm excited about this particular session, and I just know that you guys are rocking on, becoming even greater men and doing great things. I hear all the feedback and testimony, and so you guys are I'm really proud of you. Let me just dive in today. I'm going to go a little bit shorter than I have in the past to allow for questions at the end and uh, maybe for Brent and I to bounce things around a little bit. Uh, I wrote the book Men on Fire for a very specific reason. i had already written Mansfield's book of Manly Men, and i had already written Building Your Band of Brothers. And I was thrilled with how those were feeding into a broader men's ministry, a broader men's movement that's going on around the world. Good things were happening. Uh, really, really delighted. But I also noticed something. I noticed something missing from the lives of individual men. They would be part of a broader movement. They would be in men's ministries and churches. They would be getting together with guys to, you know, read books and work, work out right principles of righteous manhood in each other's lives. But still, I noticed something wasn't quite there in the individual soul. It was a fire. It was a passion. It was a jet. It was fuel. It was something in the individual life. I don't mean to be critical, but I just, I just saw something that had maybe been beaten out of them or they'd been talked out of, or maybe had never been there originally. And I began to really pay attention and study this and ask guys what they were feeling and, and do a little bit of research and do some prayer, try to figure out what was going on. What was I seeing missing? Guys could be in great organizations. They could be in great men's ministries, men's groups, uh, studying, reading. But sometimes there was just an inner dynamo missing. And so what, what could it be? And I eventually began to realize what it was. It was highly personal. Uh, it was individual to each man. Uh, but the best way I could describe it was a fire was missing. Some kind of fire, some kind of a dynamo, some kind of fire in the belly, as we say. And, uh, you know, when a guy plays really well in football on the NFL or something like that, he's just, he's just passionate. He's just out there getting it done. Uh, the announcers will often say, this guy's got a fire in the belly, man. He wants to be a success. He wants to achieve. And that's what I was, that's what I was noticing was missing. So I identified the seven sources, the seven fires that I thought were missing in men. I identified these things by talking to them, by talking to experts, by investigating what was going on. And I'm going to talk to you about some of those today. And I'm going to talk to you about some that are just uh, unique and outside the book that I wrote. Uh, but I do, and I'm not just trying to sell books. I do recommend you get Men on Fire, of all the books I've ever written, I'm getting more feedback, more testimony of changed lives from this book than any I've ever written. So I'm pretty excited about it. So let's dive in. The first fire I want to talk about is the fire of heritage. This is unbelievably important. Every man is made to be inflamed, to be inspired, to be powered in part by forces that come down from before him, from his family line, from his ethnicity, from who his people are. I realize in our generation, we've got a disconnect here. We don't tend to know a lot of history. Maybe the schools don't do a great job with it. 
and maybe uh, traditions aren't passed down, lore is not passed down from generation to generation, but it's possible you're listening to me and you're not really that aware of what's come before you. You're not really that aware of what, what's in your family line. But I want to tell you that we men are made to be set aflame, to be fueled, to be changed and inspired by things that have come before us. And I want to suggest that it's that force, it's that reality of the way that God has made us that makes us get inspired by the movies that we do. You know, we, we, we watch Band of Brothers on, on, on the HBO series. We watch um, movies about great men who have come before us and great accomplishments. Uh, we watch the past and we're inspired. You know how it is. Half the man movies any of us watch and love and would put on a list are about heroes from the past or about great people from the past or about great moments and battles and generals and leaders from the past. We're meant to be inspired by those things. And I got to tell you, whenever I've seen this begin to make a difference, uh, and whenever I've seen heritage come into the life of a person who didn't know it in advance, it has changed them. Now, I'm going to be real personal today, so I can't see who's watching. Some of you are like, most of you are likely white. Uh, some of you probably black. Maybe there's Asian, maybe there's Hispanic, maybe there's other ethnicities. Uh, among the whites, you're probably from Northern Europe, probably Norwegian, probably Nordic in some way. We all have a heritage. We all have an ethnicity. We're all part of a people group. And I got to tell you that we are meant to be set aflame by that. It's not meant to make us ridiculously proud. It's not meant to make us arrogant. It's not meant to make us exclusive. You know, just because I mentioned the fact that some of us are white doesn't mean we're, you know, we're, we obviously decry white supremacy. We obviously don't want to be separated from those who are different from us. Um, but the fact is that at the most individual level, you are supposed to be impacted. You are supposed to be inflamed. You're supposed to be set on fire and fueled and ennobled by things that have come before you, by things that come down through your family line. And I want to say quickly, even if your family, I mean, I'm being extreme here, even if every male, especially in your family, is a bad guy and locked up in prison during his life, there's still something good. There's still diamonds in the dunghill that are meant to flow into your life. You're meant to know who you are in your family line. You're meant to know who you are in your ethnicity. You're meant to know who you are in your people group. It's meant to change you. And I have to tell you that in my life, this has been quite a force. My father is an army officer. My grandfather was an army officer. Uh, earlier ancestors were uh, military, fought in the Civil War, fought in the American Revolution. So I kind of had heritage forced on me in a sense. I mean, when my father walked in the door wearing his uniform, some of his heritage was right there on his uniform, where he had served, what, what medals he'd won, you know, where he'd gone to college, all of that was right there on his uniform. Um, but I also asked questions and I also dove in just in the you know, curiosity of a child and asked my grandfather, what was, it, what was it like? My grandfather fought World War II, was paralyzed in the assault on Berlin and then got shipped off to Asia, uh, to the Philippines, where he was an assistant to MacArthur. So I've got quite a heritage. So I asked my grandfather, what, what was it like? What was it like to be paralyzed? What were the Germans like? What was it like to get shot in war? What was it like to serve under MacArthur? What was going on in the Philippines? And all of that became part of something that lived in me and was something that changes me. My father fought in Vietnam, uh, was awarded the Bronze Star, saved a bunch of lives. I mean, my life's a little bit unusual in that I come from military guys. And so the heritage was known. I went to a medal ceremony for my father and heard the a citation being read. And so heritage, even though my father wasn't a very talkative guy, uh, heritage was embedded in me. Heritage was taught to me. You know, the, the name plate on the front of our house had the symbol of a certain battalion, and that battalion had history, and my father would talk about it a little bit. Now, I'm not asking you to get a doctorate in your family history. I'm not asking you to make to read a bunch of books unless you just want to and study things out. I am asking you this. What do you know of your family history? What do you know of the people who have come before you? What do you know of even at a national level or an ethnic level has come before you uh, that, that is noble and good and beautiful and that you can claim for yourself? Um, I found out after my father died that he had saved a lot of people in Vietnam by keeping a battalion from going across a bridge that was booby-trapped. And he never told me that. Uh, but I decided afterwards, I'm claiming that. I want that kind of heroism in my life. Lord, would you please cause the heroism in my family line, both my grandfather and my father, maybe others, 
would you cause that to take up residence in my life? And, you know, you start, you just claim it for yourself. It's not like they for, people force it on you necessarily. Uh, you claim it for yourself. You understand who your people are. You understand where they came from. I do a lot of teaching in African-American history. I've guest lectured at Tuskegee and so on. It's an academic interest of mine. I got to tell you, I love what happens when a young black man who has not really been taught his history and maybe had a lot of the woundings and pressures and bigotry from society, he begins to understand who his people are, he begins to understand where blacks are in the Bible. He begins to understand uh, the great civilizations, the great African civilizations that existed while, you know, my white ancestors were still in bear cloths up in Scotland and Ireland, you know. Uh, he begins to see it and it changes him and it ennobles him. He walks out different. And I, I want to tell you that this, this doesn't have to be anything dramatic. Uh, I tell the story in the book of a friend of mine. I'm going to call him Raul. That's not his name. And Raul came from a long line, uh, frankly, of farm workers in California. And um, all he ever knew was that his, his family were migrant workers. And then his mother and his father, uh, his, I'm sorry, his mother died. Um, and he ended up living with relatives. And the reason was the father wasn't in the home. So he just got by, you know, went to college. His, his, his relatives keeping him told him he was going to have to kind of fend for himself. They had a lot of other kids. And so he worked hard. He worked at a restaurant and made money to live on and, and slept in the back room of their house and, uh, and, you know, just did the best he could. Well, there was a young executives program in that restaurant network, and he, he got the, the opportunity to do a young executives program. And through that, he got a scholarship to go to a major university, and he got a bachelor's degree, and he got a master's degree, and he became a very successful businessman. Well, uh, this is about the time I got to know him, and he was a great guy, but I'll tell you, he ached because he didn't know anything about his family line. He didn't know anything about his heritage. He didn't have a sense of anything coming down from his father's. Uh, to be embedded in him. So he began to process this with his band of brothers and talk about it a little bit. And it was just about his, that time that his father, who is uh, who was a man who had, had killed a guy and was in prison, died. He knew his father was in that prison. He went to visit him once in a great while, uh, but he didn't know anything about him and they weren't very close, but that father died. And so when my friend Raul went out to the prison uh, to collect his father's stuff, he was, just, he was just busted up because his father was the only connection he really had to any kind of ancestry, any kind of history, any kind of heritage. And so he asked a guard out there, is there anything you can tell me about my dad? Uh, anything you can tell me about him? I know he killed a guy. I know he must have been a rough customer, but is there anything you can tell me? And the guard said, listen, I, I'm not supposed to say stuff like this, but I know your dad was in for murder and he was kind of a rough guy, but he worked year round in the canteen and other places to earn enough credits so that every year when children had to come to the prison on, on Christmas and visit their you know, imprisoned uh, parent, that there was some little gift given to them. Your dad worked all year and earned the credit so that some little bit of candy, some little bit of something was given to those kids when they had to visit a parent in prison on Christmas. Your dad did that for the 15 years that I knew him. Well, Raul went out to the car. Uh, after, after he left that prison and bawled his eyes out. It was the only thing he knew, and certainly the only good thing he knew about his father at all. And so uh, he went back, and given his business skills, he started a charity uh, and, and modeled it on this act of generosity. It has to do with children, and it has to do with making a big difference in, this, in his life, in their lives. And given Raul's business skills, I mean, he has had uh, he's processed tens of millions of dollars through this charity and made a massive amount of difference. Now, when he makes speeches talking about it, he talks about his father and his father's how his father handed to him a heritage of generosity. Now, he doesn't mention prison. He doesn't mention all the other horrible stuff in his family line, uh, you know, people going to prison and stuff like that and the grinding poverty they all suffered. He just talks about that one thing. My father was a generous man and he taught me a major lesson about how to earn so you can do good in others' lives. And that's what I'm doing. And this man's made a massive difference. Do you see how heritage worked in his life? Do you see how something that came down from the family line changed his life? And that's what I want you to do. I want you to ask the question, what heritage is burned into my life? What, what of my heritage, what of my background? As I've taught this around the, wherever I can, uh, guys will get on the phone and talk to their dads or talk to their granddads or talk to their grandmothers and just say, tell me about our people. Tell me the good, the bad, and the ugly. And what they're looking for is to build on the good. What they're looking for is to be able to draw in the positive stuff 
uh, from that family line. Now, some have families where they can read books. You know, I know a Native American guy who reads books about his tribe and, and draws in that heroism, the good things about the family. Um, and others, you know, maybe their, their history is connected to something uh, major. You know, one guy I know, his dad was actually in the, the, uh, the battalion that was Band of Brothers, knew the Band of Brothers and all that kind of thing. All that to say, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a major issue. I want you to do a little bit of studying, a little bit of asking. Again, you don't have to get a doctorate. Just ask some questions at a meal. Just jot down some notes. But take the things you hear and let them live in you. Let them change you. Let them make you heroic. Let them make you strong. Let them live inside of you. And for, by all means, pass them on to your children. Tell your children these stories. My daughter went through kind of a, a little bit of a rough time at the beginning of this COVID season. Um, she uh, transitioned out of a job and she was up, she lives in New York, by the way. So you know how tough it was up there with COVID and everybody locked down. And she said to me on the phone one day, listen, if dad, can, if, if my granddad uh, can serve heroically in Vietnam and be, earn a medal and save lives and live, be that kind of war hero, I can get through this. In other words, she was inspired, a 30 year old girl was inspired by her war hero grandfather. And that story was living inside of her. Why? Because I've told that story over and over and over. And sometimes when that little girl was rolling her eyes, okay, dad, I get it. Granddad was a war hero. But the fact is that that's how it works. And so you got to embed this in the next generation. So you allow your heritage to live powerfully inside of you. And then you also uh, allow your history to, uh, to make a difference. I'm sorry, I've got, I've got a little technical issue going here. I fixed, just fixed it. Um, but you allow that history to live in you and then you pass it on to the next generation. So the fire of heritage is one of the things that's meant to live inside of you. The second one I want to talk about, and I'll do it a bit more briefly, I want to talk about the fire of battle. Now, many of us have not served in the military. Many of us are not very near military culture. I understand that. But a lot of what a man is called to do, a lot of the virtue of a man, a lot of the contribution of a man is about knowing how to battle. And I don't mean punch a guy out. I'm talking, I mean, I want you to be able to defend yourself, but I'm not talking about being a brawler or picking fights. I'm talking about being able to stand uh, for your family, for your friends, for yourself, battle spiritual forces, battle psychological forces that, that try to hold people in bondage and be that warrior that a man is meant to be. Uh, a man is meant to stand for his wife, pray for her, encourage her, know how to light her jets of inspiration, um, be, be, be strong in standing for her. He's meant to know how to fast for her and intercede for her. And yes, yeah, sometimes defend her physically. And yes, yeah, sometimes step in when things are going wrongly. He's got to know how to stand with his kids. He's got to know how to stand for, against the spiritual forces trying to, uh, trying to dominate them. Uh, I'm in a band of brothers. I've got, I've got guys around me. One of our guys suffers horrible depression. But we know how to stand with him when depression hits him. You know, we know how to stand. We know how to pray. We know how to encourage him. We know what, what verses need to be read, what examples from history, and who are his heroes in history, and how can we cite their words to light him up? He happens to love Theodore Roosevelt. Well, we're throwing the Theodore Roosevelt quotes in there. What are we doing? We're trying to stand with him. Now, his depression might be partially biological, uh, but that's for the doctors to deal with. What we're doing uh, is we are battling for him. We are standing strong. We're being warriors in his life. And men have stood with me in the same way. But much of what we're called to do is a form of battle. Um, we battle for mastery over ourselves. We battle to control our sex drive. We battle to lose weight. Um, we battle to, to achieve more. We battle to throw off the wounds of the past so we can accomplish things. A lot of manhood is a calm, peaceful battle against invisible forces. Now, again, if you're in the military, uh, maybe in the reserve, serving in the military, great. And if you ever get in a situation where you have to battle somebody physically, I pray you don't. But if you do, may you know what you're doing. And yeah, we can train for those things. What I'm talking about right now are the invisible battles. Do you know how to stand for your family? Do you know how to fight for the culture to be right in your home? Do you know how to fight for the guy in your band of brothers who's, who's suffering in some way? Do you know how to come, come around a guy? I've always liked the, the line in Tombstone, one of the great man movies. And the actor Charlton Heston, who's passed away now, uh, says in that movie at a certain point, he says, to get to him, they'll have to come through us. To get to him, a guy who's wounded and hurting, they'll have to come through us. And that's what, um, that's what I think it's meant to be about. That's how I think it's meant to work. 
Tony Zach's on this call. He's a friend of mine. He's in my band of brothers. Uh, you know what? Uh, and he's hurting. He's beaten down. Something's happened. Something's harmed him. My attitude is, you know what? For the enemy to get to him, he's going to have to come through me. For the, for, for, for the people who are trying to harm him to, to get to him, they're going to have to come through me. They're going to have to come through the band of brothers. And we're going we're gonna to pray. We're going to stand. We're going to encourage him. We're going to back them off. I've even gone to talk to people uh, who were beating on a guy emotionally and said, you got to back off. You got to stop this. Why? Because it was, it was the natural part of the invisible battle to defend my friend. And so a lot of what we're doing is battle. And I even make sure now it's a little bit more natural for me because I grew up an army brat, but although I've never served in uniform myself, but I even make sure that I stay, stay somewhat close to martial culture, to military culture. I read books a little bit. I make sure I feed on it. I read The Art of War by Sun Tzu. I read the autobiography of a general. Um, I like reading a little bit of military history. And part of it is, and of course, reading the military side of scripture. Um, it's just that I want to keep the warrior alive in me. I just want to make sure that I'm keeping that sense of battle alive. I don't have weapons all over the walls of my house. And I don't, you know, I don't have walk around flipping nunchucks at the, you know, in, in the mall or something crazy like that. But I do make sure that battle stays alive in me. I can tell what Brent does, but I don't. And so all that to say, uh, I want you to add, take a little inventory of yourself about battle. I want you to keep in mind uh, the war that we have to fight. I want you to keep in mind the spiritual war. I want you to make sure that you're reading a, at least one book on spiritual warfare. I want to make sure that you are uh, thinking about war warfare. I, I know some guys who don't ever plan to actually duke anybody out, but they're, but they go to boxing clubs and box and just, you know, practice boxing just because they want to have something martial, something warfare-ish at a natural level in their lives. And then, of course, they merge that into what they're doing in spiritual warfare and emotional warfare for their friends and so on. I want you to think for a moment about your wife. I want you to think for a moment about your girlfriend. Now, I don't mean those in the same sentence. I'm talking about those of you who are single and, and uh, have girlfriend. I want you to think about your band of brothers. I want, to think about, I want you to think about maybe some of your pastors who are watching to think about your church. Think about the guys you're responsible for. Um, how can you battle for them? What does that require? What is the nature of that battle? I'm going to be honest with you guys. One of the things that gets knocked out of us in our lives, one of the things that gets knocked out of us as men um, is the fight. You know, you we probably heard somebody say, maybe in a movie, if not anybody else, you know what? Uh, there's no fight left in him. They don't mean the guy's dying physically. They just mean he's been beaten up so bad. There's no fight left in him. And I want you not to be there. If that's where you are, I want you to get with some guys to pray for you, talk to you. Uh, I want you to get with some guys who can help you think that through and, uh, and, and to help you get rid of that. If you're that beaten up, you let them get you inspired. Let them pour some stuff into you. Let them help you and talk to you. Very, very important. All right, I'm going to move on for the sake of time. I don't want to take too much time. Uh, the third one I want to talk to you about is the power of legacy. Uh, I want you to seriously consider uh, that a man is made to leave something after he's gone. He's made to leave things written on the lives of the people in his life. He's made to embed and have an impact so that those who come after him, uh, and even those who live as a result of their, their contact with him while he's still alive in this world, that they are uh, marked in a way that is noble and powerful and that they are enabled to do more than they would ever do before. Now, most men think about legacy and they think about their wills and they think about leaving money and all that stuff's very, very important. And I believe in all that. If you follow what I do in my podcast and so on, I'm constantly talking to guys about insurance, constantly talking to guys about leaving a will, constantly uh, getting mad on the air at guys who, uh, who didn't leave anything to their kids or left, left a lot of debt or, you know, didn't leave a will. So the state got all of it or something like that. Crazy stuff. Um, but all that to say, that's certainly part of it, and I believe in it. And if you, by the way, if you need help in that area, I strongly recommend the material of my friend Dave Ramsey, one of the best financial counselors and guide, guiders I know. And uh, you can look him up, the Lampo Group. They do great work. I have no connection to any of that, so I'm not selling material. I'm just saying, if you need financial help to leave a legacy or you need wisdom about your finances, go check out Dave Ramsey. But I'm not primarily talking about that. I'm primarily talking about the way that you leave a legacy in the lives of the people who are gonna come after you? What are you embedding in the life of your children? What are you embedding um, in the institutions that you are maybe connected with? Uh, what are you leaving in the life of your wife? Uh, what is the legacy? What will people say about you? I think many of you uh, know the exercise that uh, 
where people pretend just imagine that you're writing your own funeral obitu obituary or your own funeral sermon. And what would you want said about you? And I've done that. And it's helped me quite a bit. I want certain things said about me. I want certain things to be to be declared, not that I need the ego of it, uh, but I want them to be true. So if I would really like to be described as a really generous guy, well, what am I doing with my money to leave a legacy and to have a, to have an impact and and fund scholarships and uh, put money into causes that I care about, and build things that will survive me. Um, so it certainly is all that. But also, what am I what am I doing uh, within with the, in the lives of those I have any kind of impact over? What am I embedding in the lives of my children? What am I saying to them when I'm with them? What am I doing in the life of my wife? What am I doing in the life of my band of brothers? Um, what kind of impact can I have in the community? What kind of group would listen to me so that I can maybe impact them? I want to ask you this question. What should you die, God forbid, in the next week? What will survive you? Is it enough? What can you do to build a legacy so that it, it has, is of impact long after you're gone? We're not all going to be Winston Churchill's who will be remembered for a thousand years. Uh, we're not always going to be, you know, kings and princes and generals. I understand that. But within what God has given us, what is it that we can build and do and leave that will make a difference? Some guys I know are writing, I literally write every day things they're killed. Kids won't read until they leave, until they actually have uh, left this life. Um, some guys record videos. Some guys are, are planning that a gift will be sent to their kids for the rest of their lives. Can you believe that? They're at working with the lawyers to make sure that uh, both the financial gifts and other kind of gifts are sent for the rest of their lives. Some guys are now recording coaching videos. Uh, some guys just uh, handle it by how they interact with their children or the people they have impact on. How can they leave a legacy? Some guys have started foundations. It's not that expensive and they've raised money for noble causes and it's going to make a difference. Some guys have endowed chairs of studies at universities. That's not that much. Some guys I know who don't hardly have any money, uh, but they've just put together great ideas and raised money from other people. And now they're doing great things for their ethnicity or their people group or their university or for the, for the poor. You understand what I'm saying? Men are made to leave a legacy. We, we are made to leave something beyond ourselves. And I, I don't mean to be humorous here, although I know it sounds humorous. We're all going to die. We are all going to die. And uh, unless something happens I'm not expecting, uh, society, the world will go on after we're dead. So part of the measure of a good man is that he leaves a legacy. He leaves an impact that survives him. What is that? What is that for you? How are you leaving something that will survive you? It really is, uh, can be relatively simple. Uh, but what you want is that after you're dead, your impact, your spirit, your inspiration, your gifts, your contributions, and yeah, maybe even your earnings are still having an impact. So ponder that and get the help you need. Don't let it get away from you, all right? Okay, the next one is one that I'm not going to get preachy about, but I do want to talk to you about it, and that's the fire of God. I'm going to be brief about this because I've talked about this basic theme a lot with you guys already on these LWP uh, sessions here, the Zoom sessions. I'm concerned that most men think that they are men and their, their drives and their attitudes and the things they feel on the inside of them somehow are news to God or that God's not happy with them. Uh, I'm concerned that most men uh, think that, you know, Jesus is a guy in a bathrobe with a sheep under his arm and that manhood was a mistake. Uh, it just accidentally happened. And that God is looking at men like, you know, don't touch that. Don't do that. Don't eat that. Don't behave that way. And he's kind of irritated with manhood. But I want to tell you something different. I want to tell you that God created manhood. That the basic clean drives that are in your life are things he created. And that he sent Jesus, who lived a very, very manly life on earth. Um, and that God is delighted with you. And he wants to do manhood with you. And this is really what I'm talking about when I say the fire of God on the inside. If I believe that God is ticked off at me, if I believe he's basically upset with me being a man, if I believe he's upset because I have a sex drive or because I want to eat something or I want to beat something up or I want to ride a horse or I want to scream or I want to, I want to get in a pickup basketball game and beat the tar out of somebody or whatever, uh, if I believe he doesn't understand those drives, didn't make them, and he's basically looking at me with irritation the whole time, I'll never love him, I'll never like him, and his fire will never be in my life. The fact is that God has given us this gift called masculinity. 
and he wants to partner with us in it. He wants to be our Emmanuel, the word that means God with us. He wants to be close to us in our manhood. And I, I love the fact that he sent Jesus and Jesus lived a manly life. I want you to think about the adventure of Jesus' life. I'll be real quick about this. Jesus was uh, hunted every single day of his life. That's why his, when he was born, his parents took him to Egypt and then finally up into, into the north of Israel. Uh, he, was, he worked a manly trade under his father's guidance. He was mentored by his father. It, 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 Bible, your Bible will often say that Jesus was a carpenter. It actually means carpenter and stonemason. So picture this young buff teenager picking up logs, picking up great big headstones, uh, chiseling and carving. He was buff. He was, he was, you know, I'm not saying he looked like the guy in the weightlifting magazines. I'm just saying that, that he was a guy who was tough and he was strong. The Bible says he was tempted in all ways like we are. So he knew every single temptation, even if he didn't give into them. Um, and he had tough things in his life. Again, he was hunted every day of his life. His best friends betrayed him. His family once showed up at one of his preaching sessions and and tried to take him home because they said he would had lost his mind. That's literally what it says. He had lost his mind. His brothers didn't believe in him. Uh, they said they mocked him one time. I mean, it was ugly. He was ultimately betrayed by some of his best friends. But I love the manliness in Jesus. I love the fact that he hung out with a band of rough fishermen and men for three years. I can see him pushing each other in the water and farting and laughing and throwing food. Uh, I, th I think that's the way it is with Jesus. And so I'm not going to go on to all that. Again, I've talked about it a lot. I've written about it a lot. But what I want to say to you is that God wants to partner with you in manhood. He wants to be in it. He wants to be part of it. He wants to help uh, clean you up and, and, and use all those drives you've got on the inside of you. Part of the problem for men relating to God is that men have usually related to God through the church. The church can sometimes be, I'm not picking on churches now as pastor for many years, but the church can sometimes be a feminine kind of place. And men sometimes don't relate to it. So men have got to directly relate to God and ask him to come and be part of who, who they are as men. So I want to ask you to do that in your own time, in your own way. Uh, God's not ticked. He's not angry that you're a man. He wants to illuminate and inspire and set aflame everything inside of you and, and keep, of course, your drives from taking you into trouble and being sinful. But I want you to consider the fact that God wants you to have the fire of his fire in your life. And all, all I want you to do is when you go away sometime or you're finished with the Zoom session, or you have some time later today driving in the car, just ask him. Just ask him. All right, I'm not setting up an altar call. I just wanted to talk to you honestly. All right, two more things. There are a lot more, maybe a little bit more fun than some of these earlier ones. I believe that every man is meant to have the fire of adventure in his life. I didn't write about this in the book because it might be misunderstood, but the fire of uh, adventure in his life. I, I believe strongly that this is uh, one of the things men lack. You know, we men are made for adventure. We're made to break down barriers. We are made to pursue something aggressive. I want to ask every single one of you guys, this is, this is the lightest part of it. Uh, when I say adventure, I'm not talking about going out in the woods and kill a moose. Um, Tony Zach has done that, and I worship him uh, because he's much more of a man than I am. But I, I'm mainly talking about uh, you be able to uh, serve, you be able to, to, to press against barriers and, and, and get out in the wild a little bit and be a man, push against boundaries. Um, even, even into like, you know, having a big, I don't know, a big fight in the pool, you know, with a ball with guys and just have some controlled wildness in your lives. Uh, very, very important. Um, and, and, and the reason is we're made for this. A man's made to push against boundaries. Women are more nesters on average and men are more aggressive in pursuing goals. I've even been telling guys during uh, COVID, uh, I know you can't get to the gym. I know maybe you can't go hunting. I know maybe you can't get out there like you normally do. Uh, but what I want you to do is just challenge yourself about floor ex about body weight exercises. Just challenge yourself about things you can do around the home. Just challenge yourself about weightlifting, stuff you can do in the basement. Uh, just challenge yourself about making a difference like that. Uh, very, very important. Very, very critical. This is what we're made for. Men are made for adventure. You put two guys in a break room with a piece of paper, they're going to fold that piece of paper into a triangle and start fighting a football game, right? Uh, most of you guys can't throw a Coke can away without doing a fadeaway shot into the, with a can into the, into the trash can. Uh, this is just the way we are. We are made for this kind of thing. And when men don't have it, when men get overly domesticated, when men shrivel up and spend all their time either at work or on the couch, they lose a piece of themselves. They lose fire. They lose part of what they're made to be. They lose 
who they are. And so I want you to, I want you to really think about that in your life. If your life is get up in the morning, drink your coffee, get in your truck, drive around, do your deliveries or your work or visit your sites or whatever it is, and then go home and eat and watch some TV and go and, and go to bed. And that's it. Every day, you got to bust out of that. You got you to find something that's got some controlled rowdiness in it. You got to have something that's got some controlled violence in it. You got to push against that kind of thing. Even if it's just you, you know, doing burpees and push-ups and sit-ups and, and mountain climbers and all kinds of floor ex body weight exercises, we call them, floor exercises, some people call them. Um, and just so you push yourself and break barriers. I know guys who are 95 years old who are breaking barriers and mall walking. I admire them because they're pushing against something. They're breaking new territory. They're making themselves better. Men are made for adventure. That doesn't mean that you travel across the continent on foot or that you climb the highest mountain. It just means that you're kicking butt somewhere. If you don't have that, something's going to go wrong in your life. In fact, we now know, I think psychologically, the profile has been confirmed that if men don't have controlled ethical, moral wildness and rowdiness going on in their lives in a controlled way that's healthy, they will often go looking for unhealthy adventures. We know that most men who have affairs uh, are looking for fun. They're looking for adventure. Um, they, they, you know, we, we've done the postmortem on horrible affairs that have blown up families. And the guys admitted later, you know, it wasn't really the woman uh, so much that so she was fine. But actually, I looked down, I realized my wife was actually a better woman. But what, was, what I went after was kind of the James Bond part of having an affair, the secret phone calls, the throwaway telephone, the rendezvous in the hotel, all that kind of stuff. And that's pathetic. That's pathetic that a man blows up his life because he's so stinking bored uh, that he just can't stand um, not, not doing something even destructive that you know, fills his life with some adventure. Now, the final fire I want to talk about is not one I talked about in the book, nor is adventure, by the way. But it is one I want to talk to you about now, and that's fun. It sounds like it might be connected to adventure, but fun. If we don't have fun, if we don't have rowdiness, if we don't have laughter, if we don't have just planned distractions, we get dull, we get bored, we get dry, we become uninspiring. A man's got to laugh. A man's got to blow something up. He's got to pee in the sink. He's got to have a good time. He's got to bark at the moon. Now, I know I'm sounding real pagan here, but I want to make sure that you guys are seriously thinking about uh, the level of fun in your life. Now, some of you guys are probably having too much fun, but I'm saying a lot of us, especially we get a little older, we get middle age, we get busy. Are you having some rowdiness? Are you having some fun? Are you shooting hoops in the in the driveway and then frying up some burgers? Are you are you going for a good long hike? Are you, you know, is there anything that you're doing, even just a stogie fest on a Tuesday night every week or every month or something like that? Are you doing that kind of get together that's just fun? blows off the stress, blows off the routed issue. You're not talking about Biden and Trump. You're not talking about COVID. You're not talking about economic problems. You're just having some fun and some routiness. I don't know, play poker for, for pennies or, or, or do, do whatever. I want to urge you to have some fun. And I think it may not sound like this is the kind of thing that puts a fire on the inside of a man, but fun awakens what's on the inside of a man. Fun uh, stirs him up on the inside. Fun uh, actually leads to a sense of adventure. So I don't, want you to, I don't want you to think that all the fires that God wants on the inside of you are all kind of religious-y things, biblical things, um, and, and about kind of Sunday school themes. They're about manly themes that God is part of. So I want you to take that real seriously. So I've listed six fires. The fire of heritage, fire of battle, fire of legacy, fire of God, fire of adventure, and the fire of fun. I want you to build all of those into your lives. And let God be near to you in all of them. All right, I'm going to stop so that we can have some Q&A. Brent, what do you got for us, man? Sounds good. I'm going to go ahead and launch the uh, poll that we have right now. And as I'm launching the poll for you to answer, I'm going to take a couple questions that we've had from the floor. The first question is this. Could you, Stephen, could you please give us two to three practical suggestions or how-tos of best practices to proactively pass heritage onto adult sons? Yeah, great, great question. Uh, first of all, know some of the great stories yourself. Uh, you do not want to make reading assignment to your kids, especially adult sons. Uh, you do not want to, uh, uh, you know, make it boring and dull. They've had a lot of dull history already taught them in their lives. The schools tend to do that themselves. But uh, start with the stories. Start with the excitement. Start with a tie into a movie. Um, 
my military ancestors lived at least connected to such events, uh, even if they weren't the subjects of big books and movies, um, that I can watch a movie with my son and then say, now, son, you know, your grandfather was in that battle. And uh, he wasn't right where this movie is depicting, but he was very near. And here's what he said about that. That starts to awaken heritage. It's not just an adventure story coming out of a movie, um, but it is a way that he can connect his heritage and realize what lives inside of him. The second thing, uh, so first of all, is just stories. The second thing you can do, of course, if they're readers, buy books, if they're film watchers, buy movies, um, but always make sure that after you've shared any of this, the movies, the stories, any of that, make sure you say, and that lives inside of you. See, this is the point with heritage. It's not about the intellectual knowledge. Like I keep on saying, I'm not looking for a PhD, um, you know, in whatever your family heritage is, but I keep saying that lives inside of you. Your father, your, your great-grandfather walked out of slavery, couldn't read, later taught himself to read, uh, then bought some land, built a business, and when he died, he left so-and-so to the family, uh, left a great heritage. Look what's happened since. This lives inside of you. So number one is to tell the stories, awaken the stories. Number two uh, is to constantly say, this lives inside of you. This lives inside of you. That's the issue. Everybody wants to know themselves better. Everybody is a mystery to themselves. Part of the role of dads, even for adult children, um, is to uh, call out the inside, identify, give the, give the young and even adult children a GPS for what's on the inside of them, especially when you see something inside of them that you go, hey, you know what, that's very typical of what's going on in your family line. You have that gift because it's a God-given gift to our family. And then finally, I want to tell you that once you've hooked them a little bit, uh, once you've set them up a little bit, then I'll tell you what, travel is one of the things that makes the biggest difference. Uh, I grew up in Berlin, Germany. So years ago, I took my kids back to Berlin and we went to where my father was uh, at Berlin headquarters, Berlin, Berlin American headquarters. And we went to the house and we saw tanks that had been turned into monuments. And we went to Checkpoint Charlie and we did some other things like that. And I got to tell you, that made a massive difference in their lives because it was a fun trip with dad, but also they were, you know, they were really uh, inspired by the travel and by seeing it in flesh and blood. So those are my three recommendations. Fantastic. Thank you. Here's a question from Scott. What if you aren't aware of your family history, especially on your father's side? Parents were divorced when I was five years old and my father was not part of my life. I recently read Wild at Heart by John Eldridge. So question once again, what if you aren't aware of your family history, I think as it pertains to the fire of heritage? Start asking questions. Start talking to the old ones. Uh, start starts talking to anybody you know who knew the old one. Some of what I found out about my father happened at his funeral. Some of his army buddies just told me stories there for the first time, but you can be sure my kids have heard them and that they inspire me every day. Again, I want to say to you, I don't, you know, some, for some people, their family history is obscured. There's no question about it. And if that's you, I don't want you to feel second class about that. But just, just enough of the background. And by the way, bear in mind, this isn't just about family history. It's also about ethnic history. If you are, I'm, I know you guys are living up pretty much in farm country up there, and that's why I'm saying that using this example, you know, if you come from your family line comes from Norway, and that's almost all you know, well, well, who are the heroes in Norway, and what are the Nordic people like, and what did they accomplish, and what kind of intrepid sea travelers and conquerors were they, what can you learn about that, um, if you're an African American, what a great history you have, what noble souls you can draw from, so don't just make it about your family history, because for some of you that might really narrow things too much. I know guys who have turned to their mother and their father and the mother and father said, I don't know, all the old ones are dead. All we know is that we are from such, such and such in Germany or all we know is that we're from such and such in Japan. And the guy said, okay, I can't know much about my family history, but what I can know is a lot about my ethnic history. So mix all that together and do the best you can. The main thing is once you know something, celebrate it, build it up, let it inspire you and pass it on to the next generation. Thanks very much. I have the result of our polling back. Uh, these are questions actually that um, I came up with, but in, in the book of Acts, we read about how uh, the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost and was like a pillar of fire before their eyes and fire separated on the tongues that engulfed each one of them. And I said, please select one answer. Uh, 
28% of the guys said, I'd like to continually experience the filling of the Holy Spirit. 26% of the guys said, I'm filled with God's Holy Spirit almost daily. And uh, 38% of the guys said, there's nothing more important than being filled with the Holy Spirit. So that, that was the number one answer among guys. There were um, a couple guys that said they hadn't ever been filled with the Holy Spirit. So Stephen, if you could maybe just address that. Uh, before we go on to the next uh, polling question, please. Sure, I'm happy to. Uh, in Scripture, there is the experience of salvation. There is the experience of uh, being born again. And we certainly get a measure of the Holy Spirit uh, when we are born again. There's no question about it. When the, when the disciples were born again, you know, when they saw Jesus resurrected, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. But there's also that other experience, the filling of the Holy Spirit, which we see happening constantly in Acts. We see constantly that men uh, and women are filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is an overflowing of the Holy Spirit, uh, empowering us for what we're made to do, empowering us to minister to others. And so it's a supernatural empowering from God to live the lives we're called to live and to touch other lives. And so the way this normally comes about, the way it normally happens is that a born again person uh, gets with some other people and asks them to pray for him. And, uh, and through that prayer, of course, it doesn't have to involve other people. If you don't want it to, you can just go to God directly and ask for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the full power of the Holy Spirit. Use whatever language you want. Don't get hung up on, uh, on, on language or narrow uh, traditions and what have you. Uh, the bottom line is we see two things happen in Scripture, that Jesus comes and dwells in us when we are born again, when we give our lives to him. Wonderful. But then there's a separate the old word in the King James Bible was endowment of power, power from on high, an overflowing of power um, that lives in us and is meant for our, to empower us to impact other people. And so I, I strongly urge you, uh, get people who are familiar with this experience to pray for you, uh, go to God yourself and study it out a little bit. It's a very, very important, powerful part of the Christian life. Thanks so much, Stephen. Here's another question that comes from John. How might you reach or break through to a family member or friend you know who needs to hear you and be open to knowing God and accepting support of other men? Well, the greatest way we draw anybody to God is by our own example and lifestyle. Uh, but then also, normally it happens over a period of time by seeding things in. And usually, by the way, it's not just one person who's involved in drawing this person to God. It's a, it's a team of people, so to speak, all those believers in their lives. But I strongly recommend that you share stories. I strongly recommend that you see it in scriptures. I strongly recommend that you offer to pray for them for any needs they have. Um, and just continue to, to use the word we have in scriptures, continue to witness to them, continue to tell them the truth, continue to tell them what's going on. I'm known for meeting, sitting down with non-believers, uh, maybe over lunch or something, and just tell them stories about things, not, not, not 15 at a time, but one or two stories about things that have happened in church or supernatural things that happened on the mission field or awesome things God's doing in a certain part of the world. And my Christian friends look at me and go, well, these guys aren't even believers. What are you doing? I don't care. If God's doing something awesome in the world, I'm going to tell them about it. And then that'll create a hunger in their heart to know God and be connected to him. So I want what they see in my life. I want what the things I tell them about what God's doing in the world. And I want the way that I serve them, care for them, speak scripture to them, offer to pray for them, et cetera. Uh, all of that to draw them to God. You can't pressure people. You have to be careful not to beat them up, but you certainly can make them hungry for more. Thank you, Stephen. Here's a question from Jim. I am embrace my heritage of being a Hebrew, being of a Hebrew family. As a believer or completed Jew, I have lately been considering making a liar. Does this make sense to you? Uh, he, the word's pronounced Aliyah. Aliyah. Uh, and what he's talking about is uh, becoming a citizen of, of, of Israel. Um, I have many friends who have made Aliyah. And uh, if that is what you feel called to do, if that's what you feel like you're supposed to do, uh, then do it. Obviously, you know all the concerns. Israel's a tough place to live. You certainly don't have to live in Israel to live out uh, what we, you know, Messianic Christianity. I'll call it that for lack of a better term. Um, I'm, I, I certainly affirm your heritage, your Hebrew heritage. So glad that you found Messiah. And, um, and yes, making Aliyah is a noble, noble thing. Just be sure, count the cost. If you have a wife and children, be sure and think in terms of them as well. Um, but uh, it's a, it, it, is a, it is a costly decision, but it's a noble one. 
And um, I had, I suppose I'd have to say that if I was a, if I was a Hebrew uh, and had found the Messiah and uh, didn't have obligations that kept me rooted here in the States, I'd be making Aliyah myself. So I'm with you, but count the cost, my friend. Uh, it, this is, this is not an easy thing. Thanks, Stephen and Jim. Aliyah. Uh, thank you for that lesson for me. Here's another question. Genealogy history. This is actually a statement. Genealogy history is a great vehicle to pass your family ancestral story to the next future generation. Maintaining a digital family tree with background stories and photos is one method to accomplish this goal. Any comments, Stephen, on that? Yeah, I love all that. My, my wife is deeply into ancestry. Uh, my mother was. Let me tell you the difference. My wife tells me exciting stories from my history. My mother bless her, love her with my whole heart. She's with Jesus, bored the socks off of me. She would sit me down and tell me story, tell me the, all the hyper details. And Joe, uh, he had three sons. And then they, and I was like, I, my eyes would be rolling back in my head. Love her as I did. I adored my mother, but she made it about as boring as advanced algebra. So <laughs> Uh, whereas my wife tells me the story and the adventure and the people moving across the frontier and, and uh, you know, gee, Stephen, it's so interesting given what you do and somebody four generations back did so-and-so, there's quite a connection in your family, that kind of stuff. So make it a living, make it living, make it alive, make it more than just something hyper detailed on our, on our website. And uh, yes, it can absolutely live in you. Fantastic. Here's uh, the second polling question, and then we'll have the third and we'll wrap up today. Second polling question is in Luke 24, 32, Jesus's disciples said this about being men on fire. Didn't our hearts burn with the flames of holy passion while we walked besides Jesus? And the question is, uh, what do you do that you can recommend to others to keep help keep them to be men on fire? Check all that apply. Number one we put was prayer. 82% of the guys said that prayer is is very very important uh 72 percent of the guys said that fellowshipping with other christians is really important to keep that fire burning inside of them 69 percent of the guys said that having a band of brothers is so critically important 69 percent of the guys said helping other people helps keep that fire burning within them and that is very very important the next one is uh, being in the bible uh, 56% of the guys said that that's very important. Both studying it and meditating it are very, very important. 69% of the guys said praising and worshiping God. So we have that personal relationship. We have that personal worship and that prayer that kind of reflects back. And then the last question was, can you please think of uh, one man you can pray for to receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit? Do you have the name of somebody you could pray for this month? 97% of the guys said yes they have somebody so so that's really uh setting a, a brush fire of revival across wisconsin and across iowa as we have uh, listeners and even colorado we have a listener from colorado uh who's joining us today as well well we're going to wrap up things today remember join us next month as we have december 9th at noon as our next conversation with dr stephen mansfield please mark your calendars again December 9th is coming up. So in behalf of Leading with Power across Wisconsin and Iowa, thanks so much for joining us. Be blessed and be well. And as you exit, please complete the survey that will be there as you exit today. Thanks for joining us. God bless. Be well.